Welcome to our first tribal sustainability series webinar number one. So we're going to be having several different webinars over the next year or so. And this is our very first one. And Muscogee Creek Nation is actually going to be the one getting us kicked off. This webinar is um, just their staff. And our first presenter is Mr. Dean Williams, and he is with the reintegration program over at Muscogee Creek Nation. So, Dean, I will give the floor to you. Okay, my name is Dean Williams. I'm the maintenance supervisor here at the reintegration program. Uh, Mark Argyle is the outreach specialist, uh, and I'll let Mark get into it. He'll go through the first nine or ten slides with you, just a little bit about our program. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Cargell. I'm the Outreach Specialist for the Reintegration Program. And our mission statement of the reintegration is to protect our public by offering quality community services to our tribal citizens, uh, mainly Muscogee, and reinvesting those, uh, those citizens back into society. The eligibility criteria for the program usually entails uh, you know, you got to have a felony conviction, uh, you must be enrolled within uh, Muscogee Creek Nation. Uh, you have to live within the Muscogee Creek Nation jurisdiction and you can apply for our program uh, six months prior to your release and you have two years after your release to, call it, uh, to apply for our program as well. Some, one of the services we offer to our program members is uh, on-site housing assistance uh, down here at the reintegration program. We have a 36-bed living facility located next to our office building. Uh, each unit, uh, each unit has four bedrooms and two bathrooms, along with a living area, kitchen, and laundry room. We also provide off-site housing assistance to our clients as well. Uh, some of those uh, clients could uh, be sex offenders or it could be clients that have family members that aren't able to live here at the living facility. Uh, the clients must be active. Uh, they have to uh, have full-time employment in order to receive the assistance with rent and utilities. Next slide, please. Uh, we also offer uh, food and clothing to our clients once they are released from uh, incarceration. Um, the amount on food and clothing usually just depends, uh, it's case by case, depending on how urgent the need is. Uh, we also offer a driver's license reinstatement assistance for our clients because most of them don't have a driver's license once they first get out. Um, you know, they usually have to get some type of drug and alcohol assessment done. Uh, we help with DUI classes, take them, take them to impact panel, uh, getting the breathalyzer installed on their vehicles as well, and we'll also assist with the reinstatement fee for that. Uh, we also have another program called the Homeless Veterans Reintegration Program. Uh, the services they offer is uh, job skills and vocational training, resume and employment assistance. Uh, basic essential needs, uh, support services related to the assistance of work, clothing, tools, and transportation. Uh, they also uh, assist with the government health counseling and medical health referrals. Uh, they do direct housing assistance and referrals as well. Uh, they also get them set up with the uh, VA and tribal benefit referrals. Uh, our youth services program uh, assists with food and clothing, court advocacy, mentorship, life sustaining needs drug testing, impaired vision course, speak outs, community service hours, and community life skills. Uh, you have to be a citizen of the Soviet Creek Nation. Um, the ages for that all just been 14 and 19. Uh, you have to be in custody of the Oklahoma Juvenile Affairs, reside within the Soviet Creek Nation boundaries, and you should be at risk of juvenile. We all, in the past, we've also had a welding program. It's an eight-week course in partnership with uh, us, employment training, OSU IT, and the, it used to be the uh, Oklahoma Department of Career Technology Education. Uh, we also partnered with Green Country Oak Rehab. Uh, each student, they learned how to uh, use the AKAC forklift training certification and OSHA 10 certification as well. Thank you. And here we have our greenhouse. It's a 30 by 90. Uh, it'll hold up to a thousand fl uh, flats. 
uh, different kinds of plants, uh, squash, okra, tomatoes, uh, flowers, just any type, whatever we decide to plant for giveaway and planting in our garden. Okay. And we also have three community gardens, one here at the reintegration center, one in Old Mogi at the elderly housing complex, and then also in Eufaula. And we also have uh, three plant giveaway events every year. We have a uh, elderly housing plant giveaway, Earth Day plant giveaway event at the Travel Plaza and at the Recycle Center. Uh, and then we also have another one at the Recycle Center on Monday. Our community garden partners are the Reintegration Center, which is here, and then the MCN Conservation District and the Creek Nation Environmental Services. They come down and help. And then we do partner with the Oak Mogi Elderly Nutrition Program. And we have community gardens there at the Elderly Center. And this is our garden we have here at the reintegration center. We have about a 150 by 200 foot regular garden, which of course we grow a number of things in there. And then we have a large pepper garden, which you see here. And this is our Oak Mogi community garden. We have at our elderly senior services and the elderly housing. Uh, they take care of it themselves, and as you see here, the conservation district, uh, they do a lot of the work with the environmentals at this off-site uh, program. And here we have the Ufology Community Garden uh, for the youth. They have some scat and some other things there that the uh, environmental program put on down there. Uh, and we also have raised garden beds down there uh, that they help the youth with and some elders down there. And here we have the plant, the past plant giveaway events at the Recycle Center, and we also give away at the Travel Plaza and the elderly housing. This was last year's plant giveaway event, uh, three different locations. And we had a big plant giveaway at the Travel Plaza. And of course, at the elderly services, we only plant there. And then we also give away to any senior that wants plants at no cost. Okay, in the spring planting guide, of course, we grow beans, cantaloupe, carrots, cucumbers, uh, lettuce, onions, uh, greens, okras, uh, squash. Uh, we grow a lot of tomatoes, watermelon, zucchini, uh, turnips, uh, just a number of products. Okay, and in the summer, uh, you can grow beans, black eyed peas, uh, cucumbers, eggplant, uh, mustard greens, peppers, spinach, radish and squash. And in the fall, broccoli, Brussels sprout, cabbage, carrots, uh, lettuce, mustard onions, peas, radishes, and uh, sugar peas and turnips. And of course, in the winter, you can grow all these asparagus, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, celery, uh, kale, onions, uh, radish, turnips, and spinach. And we want to thank everyone. And my name is Dean Williams, and this is Mark Harjo. If you have any questions, uh, there's my number, uh, or just send us an email. We'll try to answer them best we can. Thanks, Dean.
Christy, um, whenever you pull up Trenton's, let's go ahead and change it out of presentation mode and put it into like the bigger screen. Um, and you should be able to do that with display settings. You hit a drop down box and you're going to want to flip the screens. Okay, I see there. Ah, there we go. Okay, awesome. So our next speaker is Trenton with Muscogee Creek Nation's Agricultural Agriculture and Natural Resources. Trenton, you're up. And there's a bunch of gray boxes over the PowerPoint right now. And he's going to be sharing his slides. Oh, perfect. Perfect. We'll we'll see if I can accomplish that box change you're talking about. <laughs> I can walk you through. We'll be good. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Slash. Is it showing? You're good to go. It looks good. All right. Let's see. Let's see if I can get through this without any technical difficulties. We'll be doing all right. Like she said, my name is Trent Cassie. I'm the uh, director of the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources here at the Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, and we, we do a variety of things. Um, we're kind of a jack of all trades as it relates to natural resources and agriculture, uh, wildlife and things like that, which we'll get into um, pretty soon. But like I said, we're a relatively new division. Um, we've, we've been around less than a decade. Um, so we do lots of program creation and um, policy work as it relates to kind of doing, doing our work as we're going. Um, so by no means is anything that I share, you know, the expert way to do it or um, any sort of any sort of perfection model, but um, it, it works really well for us and the things that we try to accomplish and we just try to kind of grow and build a little bit as we go. Um, so this is a picture. This is most of my team here. Um, that's me on the left. I'm, I'll spare you having a look at me live, but that's as good as it gets right there. I'll gussy it up. That's at the groundbreaking for our um, loose square meat processing facility, which we'll be talking about more um, here momentarily. Um, but that's the rest of my staff. Like I said, it's small and mighty. We all kind of we all kind of go along and do a little bit of everything. It's really an all hands on deck situation. Um, we we you know kind of team up if we've got a lot of wildlife work to do. We do that together, and if we have a lot of ranch work, we do that and ag youth and so on and so forth. So um, really great team. Take a minute to brag on them. Um, they they always answer the call and they. Um, they do a great job of, of being kind of utility players. If we get called to do something that may not fit into the job scope, we, you know, I don't hear anything about that being in job descriptions or anything like that. It's a fantastic team. I think that that's a big part of, of being successful in any venture, especially in government, is just having the right people um, and the right seats on the bus. And, and they do a great job of that. So a little bit about our programs. Um, I've put some pictures on here. That's a, the first picture on your left is a picture of our ranch sign. Um, that was that was a couple of years ago, but that's that's the sign that's down there. Um, we're really proud of the property. We're really proud of the um, agribusiness operations as a whole, and so we kind of like to we like, we're really proud of those and like to show those pictures off as much as we can. Um, th the next picture is the Muscogee Creek Nation Ag Youth Program. Uh, got a grant a couple of years ago. We wrote a BIA grant and received it to take um, Creek students on a trip to DC, much like um, the trip you might see FFA take. Um, or, or 4-H or, you know, another one of those big youth organizations. Um, so we, we put out the, we put out the application. We had a ton of applicants and we took 25 kids. There were, there were only four adults. Uh, we took 25 kids and they did a fantastic job. The kids did great. We got to do a lot of really neat things. Obviously we hit all the museum circuits and, uh, we went to the Supreme court, did all those things. We met with our, our lawmakers, um, we got to meet with then representative Hall, Deb Holland in her office and her chief of staff and, and she took time to take pictures with everyone um, and visit with us in this cramped little hallway. Um, we took pictures back when you could get close to people in, in a small area. Um, we did all that. The kids had a blast, but that's one of our that's kind of one of our shining moments was this picture under the um, equal justice under law sign. Um, and this was the day we were hoping that they would announce the McGirt decision. Uh, which they didn't do. It wasn't McGirt yet, but they didn't announce it that day. So that was kind of a cool historic moment for us to be there. Um, and our ag youth component is really, it's kind of the heartbeat of what we do. We really try to to do everything we have with with kind of our youth in mind. And so um, really wanted to take some time to talk about that. Um, and then that's the recently, the, in the bottom left is our recently um, designed kind of branding for our Loop Square Meat Company, um, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But some of our programs um, agribusiness under that umbrella, we have Loop Square Ranch, um, which is our ranch down in Dustin, Oklahoma. 
Um, we have Hannah Farms, which now primarily grows forage, but um, has, has done and will continue to do a variety of things as we move forward. And then the Loop Square Meat Company will, will fall under that um, program as well. Then we have the Natural Resources and Fencing um, Program, and that's a self-governance program that um, we use to build fence or repair gates or any external structures on any of the nation's properties. Um, we don't do work yet for citizens. That's, that's another program that, that does some of that work. But um, anytime the nation either buys a property or leases one or anything like that, um, any, any fencing needs, we, we would handle that. And then any sort of like clearing brush work, um, you know, kind of working with government agencies to get programs for the nation's land goes to that program as well. Um, we have a relatively new wildlife program, but we just started it this past year where um, we kind of organized a lot of our, our lands that are well suited for outdoor recreation, hunting and fishing. Um, we set up a permit system, which we're hoping to expand um, to allow citizens to be able to come on our properties and um, harvest wild game, whether that's fishing or, or hunting. Um, so we, we have a lot of access to that, knowing that a lot of folks don't have land they can do that on. Um, so we're, we're trying to come up with a way to kind of expand access to that. And it was really timely, especially this year as COVID hit. Um, you know, nationwide hunting and fishing license sales skyrocketed and outdoor people were just getting outside more, accessing public lands more. So it was really timely and it really worked out well. Um, I think we opened up about 3,000 acres, somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 acres last year um, for hunting season for citizens. And so I'm looking to expand upon that as we kind of build here. We have a storm shelter program, which Amy runs. Um, she does a really fantastic job where we um, we have a point preference system that folks apply and we put in somewhere between 20 and 30, depending on the cost um, of storm shelters a year for um, citizens. And then we have the Ag Youth Program. Like I said, it's one of the ones we're the most proud of. We have an all Indian livestock show annually where um, Creek youth from anywhere in the United States, but um, any tribal citizen that lives within the reservation can come show at that livestock show. It's a 100% payback. Um, we so everything that we take in for entries, we pay back to kids. So they make it. They make a lot of money. They do a really good job. Um, it's one of those shows where they can gain back and recoup some of those expenses of showing livestock. Any of you that have been involved in, in that sort of a deal know that anytime you can make a little bit of feed money back, that's great. Um, and then we add on prize money as well. So the kids do really good. Um, it's nice. It's a nice little warm up. We typically have it in January, so it's a nice little warm up show for um, the spring shows and OIE out in Oklahoma City and all that good stuff. We do an annual poultry show. We have an annual speaking contest. Um, we just started a shooting sports contest, so we've done archery for um, quite a while. Program, excuse me. We've done archery for quite a while, where we support students as they do archery at their local chapters. Um, and we just got uh, cleared through council and, and partnership with the state to start a shooting sports program with shotgun sports. So um, the sporting clays and clay pigeon stuff that they're doing a lot of ag chapters are doing now. We're going to be able to support students in that. Um, still fleshing out what that support looks like. But, you know, in archery, we provide we'll, we'll provide money for a bow and we help pay with expenses for camps. And we do the same for leadership and speaking camps. Um, so we kind of support the local 4-H and FFA chapters. Everything we do is geared towards supporting those folks in their local communities. And so um, uh, Billy, our Ag Youth Manager, he does a fantastic job of going to banquets and supporting financially and, and other ways. And he goes to all the stock shows and helps kids show. And those students that don't have someone that can kind of help them find an animal and get an animal ready, um, he's, he does all that. He does a fantastic job. He, he runs like he's on fire all the time and, and he really enjoys it and does a great job. And then we have our policy and outreach arm, um, which is, you know, any anytime there's a policy or, um, you know, public comment period or anything like that that could affect the natural resources of the nation. Uh, we try to take a look at that working through our both the Secretary of Interior's office here and the Secretary of the Nation and Commerce um, and help provide any you know content area expertise that we can to make appropriate comments. So I've said Loop Square a couple of times. That's the name of our um, meat processing facility, and it's it's now the, it's kind of the name of our ranch. Um, the way that came about, obviously, that's the Creek Nation seal there in the middle, which most of you have probably seen. It's it's heavily ag centered. It's got a plow and farm ground and some wheat stacked up there. And so um, the nation the nation takes a lot of pride in being you know being an agricultural people, and um, they were very successful down in the southeast before removal. Um, farming and growing crops and, and big swaths of crops. 
Um, and so, so agriculture is not anything new to the Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, they've always done it with an eye to the earth. So um, you hear that cliche thrown around a lot by, you know, the mainstream and, and any conversation that kind of involves sustainability and um, having an eye on the earth and having, you know, sustainability in mind. And so I think the tribal nations by and large have done a great job of focusing on that. And that's something that we hope to bring to this operation. Um, so the loop square is that little symbol you see there on the right. Um, it, that's from the Muscogee Creek Nation branding guide. Um, it was found on some artwork, I believe, in Tennessee in a cave, and they um, they use it to represent the earth. And so we we kind of decided back when um, kind of me and my team came in, there was there was quite a bit of transition, and so we were kind of looking to rebrand a little bit. And so we registered a brand with the state um, the state registrar in Oklahoma for our livestock, um, obviously to cut down on livestock theft and things like that. And so we really wanted to use something that was unique. Um, in, in the past, we had just used a CN, um, which several of the tribes had have, actually have used. So we decided to kind of look for something that was a little more um, unique and, and, you know, difficult to alter. And so we landed on this loop square, which I'll show you a picture of how we did that um, in, the, in the end. But it, it kind of helps us remind, you know, every time we put that on, on a head of livestock or see it on the signs or, or see it in our branding, it really reminds us that, you know, it, it, takes, it takes a lot to make this thing not only profitable, but sustainable and to make sure that we can pass it down to generations and generations. And it just really helps us to be conscious of what we're trying to do here. Um, and so, like I said, that's the loop square, which represents earth. Um, and on the left, I have sustainable, which is something we talk about a lot in the ag industry. Um, and we try to kind of, we kind of try to not dumb it down, but simplify it when we're having those conversations to where we say, you know, sustainability has maybe has a lot of um, long or, or, or in-depth definitions or descriptors, but the way we view it is we're making decisions um, based on the future and with the future in mind. It's kind of how we try to talk about it. So here's the ranch. I'm sorry for breaking every slideshow rule and, and protocol, but I'm, I couldn't sort through these pictures. We get a lot of good ones out there. It's a beautiful country on the reservation. Um, but here, here's the ranch. That picture on the top left was taken during the most recent snowmageddon we had. Um, and then some beautiful sunset pictures. You can see the brand there in the center um, that we have registered with the state. So obviously it doesn't close all the way on the loops to keep um, keep it from blotting and just being excessively painful in the livestock. Um, so it looks open, but that's the loop square. Um, you can see it on a calf there, a heifer that we that we bought in and, and put the brain on her. Some cool sunset pictures. That's Earl Gray, our horse, and my cow dog sis. We move um, all of our livestock with with horses and, and cattle or horses and cow dogs. Um, they do a great job, really, really work on stockmanship. Um, handling everything slow and easy, making sure we don't have any wrecks for people or for the livestock. Um, we want to keep them calm and keep them easy to handle and uh, maintain a low stress environment. So we really work hard on that and the staff does a great job. Uh, and that bottom right picture, I talked to earlier about making decisions with the future in mind. Um, those two, the two on the right are my children. Um, and then the, the gal up on top of there proudly on top of that hay bale is one of, is one of the, ranch, the ranch staff's um, daughters. And so they're heavily involved, you know, they're always around. Ranching is one of those things that, that takes place at all hours and all times. So sometimes to spend time with family, they've got to come sit in the feed truck with you. Um, and our kids certainly enjoy that. So it's really a good reminder, a fresh reminder for us to kind of keep an eye on what we do and don't, don't push the limit too much, um, chasing one thing and forget about what's important. So we primarily uh, right now run cow calf, uh, a cow calf operation. Um, we run a few yearlings, especially now that we have the meat processing facility. Um, and in the past, we've also sold some hay. We didn't this year because our cow herd has expanded significantly. So we held on to all of it this year, um, which actually turned out really well because we're going to make it about perfect with just a tiny bit of carryover um, this year on hay. So we try to do um, some different things with grazing to limit the hay that we feed. And I'll get to that in just a second. But we have a commercial Angus and Brangus cow herd. Um, our cattle, with, with being down south in such a high moisture environment most of the time, um, especially over in McIntosh County, where it's it's quite a bit more wooded and a little more jungle-like at times. Um, those cow have just, having just a touch of that ear, that Brahmin influence, do really well for us. So we um, we we crossbreed kind of bring us bulls on our commercial cows and and have a, a female with a little with just a touch of ear and a little extra leather um, helps them navigate the heat. They're a lot more pest resistant, and we have to you know we have to put a lot less inputs into them and thus into the environment because of that. Um, and then we run Charlay and Brangus bulls. Everything that we're going to run through the market is bred to Charlays because uh, they're a big, beefy breed. They put a lot of pounds on the hoof and they grow really efficiently. Um, and then we have some good moderate 
um, you know, re really good confirmation, get around good, good feet and legs, good disposition, Brangus bulls um, that we put on all of the females that we hope to keep replacements out of um, so that we can kind of shape and make our cow herd fit our environment that way. Um, we retain and purchase replacements, so we're not to the point yet where we can just churn out our own all the time, but so we do bring some in, but we try to make sure they kind of fit our type and kind. And that's that picture there, that heifer um, with the red, the red heifer with the white face and her a little bit of ear with the yellow ear tag and then the black heifer behind her with the yellow ear tag. That's kind of what we're looking for. Um, cattle was just, a, like I said, a little bit of ear, a little bit of heat tolerance. Really, we don't mind to get out and work um, and do a good job raising a, raising a baby calf as well. On the rotational grazing, we, we do a variety of grazing um, on a macro level. Um, I guess you would call it rotational or seasoning, seasonal grazing. Um, we, we shift from uh, summer grazing range to fall and winter grazing ranges, and then we kind of bring them back. So in the summer, um, those pastures that we send cattle to after everything's calved out, uh, they're, they're kind of spread all out all through the jurisdiction. It's really good grass. Um, we manage it for weeds and control burn where we can and all that good stuff. So it's really good grass. It's had a good head start, time to kind of grow before we ship stuff to summer range. Um, and then in the, so once they get to the summer range, we will also do rotational grazing or management management intensive grazing on site. So we have most of our pastures broken up into smaller sections that we can kind of bounce cattle around and rest the ground as we need to. Um, a lot of times in the summer rain comes all at once and then not at all for a while down here. So um, it may be a case where we just need to we know rain's coming next week and we need to rest the pasture for you know that week and a couple more to give it a shot of growth. And so we'll do that. We'll fence them in the backside and let the front side grow or, or something like that. And then in the fall, um, typically right before hunting season, which in Oklahoma is October, um, you know, right, at, right before fall calving, we'll bring everything back home to Dustin, um, which is our headquarters there in Hughes County. And we keep everything there close. So hopefully in that, in that time frame that they've been grazing on summer grass, the grass in Dustin has had time to grow. And so we have, a, you know, we have a little bit of growth there. We're able to cut down on the amount of feed that we have because of that residual grass growth. Um, and that's that picture there with that heifer, that's her coming back to um, from summer grazing to the fall range. So, you know, the ground does really good if you treat it well. Um, and so we've really we've really kind of gotten to the habit of having that as a fallback and not having to put out any hay until pretty late in the fall or, or early winter, um, as long as the cattle are doing well and maintaining growth and body condition on the on that grass. Um, we, we do a lot. We have a lot of partners. Um, and I'll go ahead and mention them. Environmental services, which is where my building is, or where my office is, where we office with them. Um, they really do a good job in a lot of ways. They they help us out with our property cleanups. They have the big roll-off dumpsters, and I, I'm not sure if they're presenting later, so I won't I won't spill too many of their beans. But um, they've been a fantastic partner, bouncing things off of them and making sure that we're in compliance with any sort of environmental regulations. Um, you hear things a lot through the grapevine of. Um, restrictions and and new regulations or new um, law being written, things that may affect agricultural producers. And so it's a, it's a super valuable resource for us to have this environmental office here where we can go bounce things off them and make sure that um, anything coming down the pipeline we're either able to comply with or we're able to make comment on. Um, so they're an invaluable resource. We work a lot with the NRCS um, through EQIP and Strike Force to implement conservation programs. Um, I'm not going to say that every one of them is 100% cost share where you make your money back, but it's very worth it. And several of them are. Several of those programs, if you implement them right, um, you'll you'll your costs will be covered by the reimbursement through the NRCS. So fantastic programs. I would encourage any um, ag folks or land managers out there to, to look into those programs. Um, we work with the BIA. A lot of our land is trust land, and so um, the burn permitting process goes through them, and a lot of our work goes through them. We get quite a bit of grant money from them, um, whether that's for cedar eradication uh, or feral swine eradication. I, I said our burn permits. They have forestry programs. Um, they're a really good resource. You, you have to know how to play by their rules and you know know what they're asking for. So um, it takes patience and it takes open lines of communication on both ends because you know largely they don't control what they have to have either. So um, it's good to just get with them early and often. Is kind of what I tell tribes when they they ask me. Um, if you're going to do anything in the BIA's purview, get with them early and often and, and make sure that you um, hang in there with them. That picture on the bottom left is our new skid steer with our forestry implements. And that was that was purchased with the BIA um, grant. And so it's one of that's one of the ones we've been really proud of and we really enjoy. 
um, you know, the fact that we have that that resource there that we can access to, to improve our tribal lands. We work with the MCN Conservation Commission, which is a, um, an independent agency here at the nation, but they work just like all the other conservation districts throughout the state. Um, they've, they've gotten uh, really good at doing outreach and partnering with, with folks to help um, increase the spread of that outreach and engage citizens in that process for um, whether it's tribal specific or just agricultural information as a whole. Um, so we've really enjoyed working with them. Run through these other ones real quick. The state of Oklahoma, we work with them on some feral swine eradication. Um, we engage a lot with the Oklahoma Cattlemen's Association for policy and other protections, primarily, um, you know, the old adage, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. We like to make sure that a tribal voice is heard. Um, so we try to stay active in any of those organizations that we can. The FSA has been a great partner in terms of crop insurance and livestock indemnity program. And um, especially this past year with the CFAP, the agricultural relief through the coronavirus funds, um, that's, they've been a great partners as well. And then the American Association of Meat Producers, relatively new partner as we're opening this meat processing facility, but um, they've been an invaluable source of information so far. So kind of getting down to what, what we were talking about here today and, and the food sustainability and, and kind of our, our eye on that. Um, this is a map of, I, I took this off the USDA ERS, uh, the Economic Research Service. Um, all of those colored areas represent either a component of or actual food insecurity. So as you can see here, we, I've got it pulled up and selected where it, it um, looks at low income and low access. So between one and 20 miles, it breaks it down one to 10, half to 10. And so you can see throughout our reservation, which is right smack dab in the middle, um, there is a lot of our reservation that is food insecure, uh, meaning they either don't have access to food or um, they're very low income and can't afford food or a combination of that. And maybe there is food close by, but they can't get to it because of any number of factors. Primarily in our area, it's because of um, just vast, vast distances between where, where folks live and where grocery may be. Um, a lot of times these communities, if they're lucky, will have a, a, a gas station, convenience store, but access to nutritious food is, is, is a difficult issue for a lot of, a lot of folks. Um, and some of them have to drive an hour to get to the nearest, to the nearest grocery store. And so um, we, really, we really have been looking at ways since we came in to kind of connect the dots is, is kind of how we look at it. How do, we, how do we connect what we've got or what we can get and what we can do here at the nation to um, address some of these needs? So as you can see, the reservation has a lot of food, um, food insecure areas and areas considered low access. Um, and then we, you know, we have the ranch initially, we have the ranch that's churning out beef calves, but you know, we didn't initially have a way to get those into anyone's hands. So um, that's where we kind of landed with this um, Loop Square Meat Company. Um, we thought that it was pertinent to tie it to the to the ranch with the loop square brand and it really it really folds in well with what we're trying to do holistically you know making sure that our environmental Im impact is as little as possible and that we're doing all the right things above and beyond what we're asked and required to do um you know the nation is uniquely positioned with such a great environmental services um staff that you know we, we feel like we've got a leg up in that area because a lot of these folks that are opening these facilities or running these facilities um, they don't have someone, you know, someone, let alone a whole entire staff full time looking at environmental regulations and doing testing and things like that. So we really feel like we have a leg up there um, and able to, you know, kind of able to stay ahead of the curve and make sure we avoid any big disasters because we have um, such great partners to work with. So the processing facility will be on Highway 75 here in Oklahoma. Um, it's between, it's kind of between Glenpool and Obolgie near a community called Beggs and a community called Winchester. It's going to be 25,000 square feet. Um, it has about a 50 head per week processing capacity. So that's livestock that we bring in live. Um, and then we have increased processing capacity in, uh, in the middle of the facility where we can bring in boxed products. So a uh, product that other facilities have taken through the initial harvesting phase. Um, we can bring it in boxed frozen so we can buy the quality we want and the and the um, numbers that we want, the quantity that we want, and we can break that down into a retail product in our facility. Um, we'll have a USDA and we'll have USDA inspection on one arm. So we kind of have two sections in this facility. Um, the large area is going to be, you know, primarily beef and pork and also sheep and goat, and that's going to be USDA inspected. So uh, we'll have a USDA inspe inspector on site at all times and a USDA veterinarian 
on site. Anytime we're bringing in livestock live to process, they'll be all be reviewed by USDA officials. Um, sanitation will be monitored by the USDA and signed off on every day and all that good stuff. So that gives us lots of protections as a nation, but it also gives citizens protection if they want to sell that product. They have no they have no um, boundaries on that. They can sell products um, outside state lines across borders um, into any state because of that USDA inspection. So folks can bring it in and choose to get their livestock um, USDA inspected, or they can come in and just do custom exempt if they're going to keep it themselves and not sell it. Then we're on the wildlife side. Um, that's going to allow us to have a lot more flexibility. So during deer season, which is obviously huge down in this area. Um, citizens will have a place and, and anybody that, can, that wants to can bring the, the wildlife, they the deer that they harvest, um, bring it in, have it processed in a timely manner. Um, and we'll be able to do a variety of, of value add products with their venison as well, um, which is a super healthy source of protein. And we don't have to shut down our beef and pork production because the USDA side won't have to overlap with the deer side. So we're really excited about that. And then when deer season is not going on, we'll be able to bring in more of that box product, like maybe bison or some elk um, from certified vendors and be able to bring that in and put that on the retail shelves as well. Uh, like I said earlier, we'll have a retail space. So um, obviously meat is gonna be a big portion of what we sell, meat and protein, but we're gonna have produce and dairy as well. Um, initially, we'll, have to, we'll probably be buying all that, but we're hoping to find partners um, kind of in the interim to be able to grow and pr produce that, whether they're citizens or other programs of the nation um, like reintegration talked earlier and they have greenhouses and several folks within the nation do, um, you know, have them kind of providing some product and us, us obviously purchasing it, purchasing it from them. And then long term, we would like to where we can get to where the nation is just producing as much of our own as, as possible, whether that's through the division of ag, building greenhouses and, and growing produce or um, outside partners, like I talked about earlier. So we'll do our own livestock. Um, obviously, from the ranch, we'll go full farm to fork. Um, we'll be able to, you know, tell the story of the day that that calf was born all the way through if, if that's the interest that folks want. Um, and we'll also take in product um, and cattle and, and pork from outside as well. So any, anybody in the community can come and bring their livestock to us and we hope to be able to give them back a nice, uh, clean quality and safe product. Um, and there's a, there will be a service component. I get asked this a lot of whether we're going to be trying to sell meat all the time or whether we'll just or whether we'll be giving some away. And so. There will be a service component. I mean, the administration and the National Council and everybody involved is is uh, is very much looking forward to using this facility to provide protein to those that need it. Um, but what that's going to look like, I don't know yet. That takes place way way above my pay grade, and and um, they will, you know, they'll kind of hash those programs out, and then we'll we'll be the administrators of that. I would imagine um, when that comes, along with our child nutrition and and our nutrition services over here. Any questions? Um, I know that was a lot and I try to go fast and get through it in a timely, timely way, but um, that's my contact information. You know, feel free to shoot me an email. It's down there at the bottom or um, give me a call if you have any questions about anything that we have going on or any ways that we might be able to partner. Um, we'd be happy to do that. Awesome. Thanks, Trenton. Our next speaker is going to be Christy Lawson with Muskogee Creek Nation Environmental Services. And if you guys want to take questions after you're done, Christy, we can do a short question. And then if anyone has any questions after that, then we can they can email you guys or however. Yeah, that'll be fine. Hold on just a second. Okay. Um, I am Christy Lawson. I work for the Office of Environmental Services. I am their sustainability specialist. Um, I work for Muscogee Creek Nation. Uh, we have 11, uh, we, our boundaries include 11 counties. Uh, we're the fourth largest tribe and our executive branch includes Principal David Chief, or <laughs> sorry, Principal 
Chief David Hill and Second Chief Del Beaver. And the Office of Environmental Services is under the Secretary of Interior, Jesse Allen. Uh, some of the topics I'm going to discuss today is food waste in America, the importance of composting, what is and is not compostable tips uh, for successful composting, the benefits of gardening, uh, the four uh, beneficial peas, which are uh, predators, parasitoids, uh, pathogens, and pollinators. And I'm also going to talk about some other sustainable gardening practices like cover crops, pollinator strips, head groves, and uh, buffer strips. Christy, not to interrupt you, but you're not sharing your screen. Am I not? No. <laughs> you oh, had it no. up and then it, you must have stopped sharing on accident. <laughs> well, let me see if I can fix that. I'm so sorry, you guys. Oh, you're okay. You're okay. I was, I was <laughs> trying to just weasel in there, you know, <laughs> like, so you didn't interrupt. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Dang technology. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, we can see it now, but you do have, there we go. Okay, yes, we can see it. So, so sorry for that. All right. Um, so food waste in America. Here's some food for thought. Let me move this little box here. Uh, the United States is a global leader in food waste. Uh, the average American, we discard uh, about 40 million tons per year of food. Uh, that's about 80 uh, billion pounds of food, which equivalents to $161 billion worth of food that we throw away. Uh, each person throws away about 219 pounds of waste each year, uh, and about 30 to 40 percent of our food supply gets thrown away, which is crazy. Um, some more statistics about food. Uh, it's the single largest component that takes up space in landfills. Uh, about 22 percent of our solid waste is food. Uh, the average amount of food that a household uh, throws away is $1,600 a year. Um, we have a very large amount of people that are suffering from food insecurity, uh, which include 11 million children and more than 80% of people discard perfectly good food because they just misunderstand the expiration labels. Um, something else that I did not mention in this slide and I found really interesting. I was looking into the other day, uh, a lot of stores, they throw away a lot of perfectly good food. They can't sell it. Um, it's too much paperwork for them to uh, donate it. So what they do is they damage it and it becomes a tax write-off uh, for them instead of donating it. And there's some uh, states that are actually starting a uh, donate, don't dump legislation, uh, which that's something I would like to look into for the Muskogee Creek Nation. Uh, I love the idea. Um, I hate the idea that, you know, people throw away food and a lot of these people that are throwing away the food, you know, they get paid minimum wage uh, they're, they're struggling as it is, and then, you know, they're told that they have to throw away this food or they're going to be fired. Um, so it's, it's a huge problem in the United States, and we're not the only country that's dealing with it. A lot of other countries are dealing with it as well. Uh, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement there, and uh, we need to do something about it. Um, you know, it all starts with you know, reducing our, our production of food. We produce way too much. Uh, and then in turn, it goes bad. We throw it away. There's a lot of spoilage there. Like I said, a lot of, a lot of companies, it's, it's less paperwork for them to just throw something away than it is to donate it. Uh, you know, the, the next step is feed hungry people, you know, donate that food to food banks, uh, soup kitchens, you know, right now with COVID, there's a lot of people struggling. There's a lot of people that could use that food. Um, the next thing is, you know, feed animals. There's a lot of starving animals out, you know, just diverting those food straps to the, to the animals can save them. Um, industrial uses like the oil, uh, recycling that, composting, and you know the least preferred thing you know for food is having it go to landfill because uh, we're we're running out of land and it's it's not good for the water quality. It's not good for our health. Um, it's not good for the environment. It's not good for animals. Uh, we we need to learn how to be more sustainable. 
uh, and close that loop. Uh, so what is composting? Uh, a lot of people call it black gold. Uh, it's a mixture of organic materials that have had months to break down. It contains uh, nutrients uh, that improve the structure of soil, uh, add nutrients back to it, uh, attracts beneficial insects, earthworms, suppresses soil diseases, uh, provides nutrients throughout the growing season. Uh, some of the benefits of composting is it improves the health of your garden. Uh, helps save you some money. Uh, it benefits the environment by reducing the amount of waste that gets sent to landfills. Uh, but like I said, unfortunately, composting isn't a normal part of our food prep routine. Uh, so what is compostable? Uh, green materials, fresh green, grass clippings, kitchen scraps, plant trimmings, uh, green leaves, flowers, fruits, vegetables, all those things. Uh, those are considered green materials. Those are your moist things that you want to add to your compost whenever it's dry. Uh, then you also want to add the green materials. Uh, I'm sorry, the brown materials are going to include like brown dry leaves, uh, branches, dry grass, straw, hay, sawdust, uh, coffee filters, napkins, shredded paper, all that's considered dry material. And you add those depending on whether, you know, your, your compost is moist or dry. It depends on which one of those materials that you need to add. Um, some of the things that aren't compostable, uh, do not put meat or fish in your compost. Don't do it. It attracts bugs. It's nasty. It stings. You'll have your dog digging in your <laughs> compost. Uh, dairy products, animal fats, oils. Coated paper products, uh, I did say earlier, you know, you can put shredded paper in there, but like the coated plastic uh, paper products, like your, your plastic cups and paper plates, do not put those in there. They'll take, they will not break down. Uh, coal and ash from the grill, do not add those. And of course, pet waste, you, you don't want to add that to your compost. Some of the keys to uh, success is the material balance. Like I said, uh, you, you want to make sure that you're keeping a nice mixture of the brown and the greens. You want to have more brown than green in your compost, uh, usually about a two to one ratio. Um, once the pile is established though, you can kind of add the materials as needed without layering. Uh, over to the side though, you can kind of see how to you know, start a compost You've never done one before, you want to put wood chips at the bottom, you want to put some green leaves, brown leaves, grass clippings, kitchen waste. And you always want to cover your kitchen waste with some brown leaves. Um, and once you've got that going, you, you aerate that, which that's the next key to success is aerating. Uh, you want to make sure that your compost has oxygen. Uh, if you, you press it down too much and you you compact it, it's not gonna get the oxygen that it needs to uh, complete that breakdown process. Um, another thing with aerating is you wanna be careful uh, not to poke the sides of whatever you're using as a compost. You can see here, uh, and you, you, can, you can look up all kinds of different ways to build compost. You really cannot go wrong with the compost and the, the, the cool thing is you learn something each year, you know, from your garden and from composting. So that's one of the things that I, I enjoy the most about gardening is just learning that, that new thing each year. Um, another key to success is you want to control the heat. Uh, you want to make sure that it's at a certain temperature, usually 140 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit is the ideal temperature uh, you want your compost to be at. Uh, under that, it's not going to break down as fast. Uh, so during the winter months, you know, your compost, it's going to take a longer time for it to break down. During the summer, it's going to speed up the process. The sun uh, speeds up the microorganisms responsible for the composting. It helps, helps speed up that process. Um, some, like it says at the bottom, some regions, though, you know, if it's got longer periods of time, then the, the breakdown process is significantly slower. Uh, another important thing is during the summertime, you want to watch that temperature because if your compost gets too hot or if you have an indirect sun, I have heard of compost catching on fire. <laughs> so you want to you want to make sure you have it in a good spot and check that temperature fairly often. 
Another key to success is that balanced moisture, uh, making sure that uh, it, it feels damp, like a, a well-run sponge, but you don't want it too wet. If it's too wet, add a little bit of brown material, stir it up. Uh, or you can also add rainwater. That's honestly better for it. But if you don't have rainwater, you know, regular garden hose water will work as well. Uh, some tips for year-round composting in the spring. You want to dig out any unfinished compost from the bottom of your compost bin. Uh, stir compost to add some soil to kickstart your pile. Add materials from the garden, yard prep, cleanup, all that stuff. You can add to your garden and get it going. Uh, during the summer, you want to keep that process going by turning it regularly, adding water, making sure that it doesn't get too dry, uh, and adding fresh materials uh, to it regularly. And then in the fall, you can remove your finished compost, add that to your garden, that nutrients gets into your garden, you know, puts all that nutrients back into your food for that next year. Uh, it's really healthy for the soil. Um, you can also save some leaves in the fall. I usually, I have about three different compost bins. One of them is when I build all my food scraps, my coffee grounds, all that. And I add leaves from my other, I have two big composts that I just have leaves. And, uh, one of them I've sorted through and got the sticks and stuff out. The other one, you know, still has some sticks and stuff. And I go through there and add it to the other one. And the other one goes in there. So it's kind of like a three-step process. Uh, in the colder temperatures, like I said, it takes longer to break down. I still compost, though. I, fingers crossed, you know, <laughs> uh, everything will go all right, and I'll have some some good compost in the spring. Um, so, like I said, legislation it differs from state to state on composting. There are some places like California, Colorado, Massachusetts that have established established uh, composting programs. And they've been really successful. Uh, New York last year was able to keep nearly a, a hundred thousand tons of waste out of landfills, which, which is amazing. Uh, I, I feel like it's really important for us to be thinking about where our waste goes whenever we throw it away. And if it can be repurposed or reused or recycled in any way, we need to be doing that. Um, some of the physical benefits of gardening, uh, weight loss, blood circulation, flexibility, reduces bone loss, stronger immune system, vitamin D, strength, improved coordination, and, you know, not to mention the health benefits to it. We've seen everybody seem to be gardening last year, uh, last spring, you know, with COVID. And it's it's a good therapy. It's, it's, it's cheaper than therapy, you know, getting outside and getting your hands dirty and, you know, doing something and, and growing something. It, it, it does something to the soul. It makes you feel good. Um, some of the environmental benefits of gardening, uh, it cleans the air in the ground, uh, reduces cooling costs whenever you well place trees and shrubs uh, for your house. Growing your own food supplies reduces the carbon footprint because you're not having, you know, food shipped from here to here to here to here. There's, there's a huge carbon footprint in anything that we purchase from a store. Um, it prevents soil erosion, replenishes the nutrients in the soil helps to reduce noise pollution and supports beneficial insects and birds. And I'm gonna talk about one of my favorite subjects, uh, the four beneficial peas, uh, predators, parasitoids, pathogens, and pollinators. And I have pollinators highlighted because everybody knows about pollinators. We hear a lot about pollinators. Everybody loves pollinators and you know, they're pretty and I got some pictures there, some monarchs and some little bum bumblebees and, uh, so these are also known, uh, the predators, parasitoids, and pathogens are also known as uh, natural enemies. Uh, they help reduce the abundance and density of other organisms that might be uh, danger, dangerous into your, to your garden. Uh, predators, these uh, can be beetles, bugs, lacewigs, flies, maggots, wasps. Um, the dull and immature are often generalist, uh, so they kill and consume many prey, uh, generally larger and faster than their prey. Uh, there's 200,000 different species, and uh, these remove evidence. So they're kind of it's kind of hard to tell if you have a, a predator in your garden because you won't find the evidence. They they eat and consume the evidence. Uh, the parasitoids or parasites often. Uh, uh, are not visible. 
these uh, these are more specialized and they choose their their host. Uh, they usually lay their eggs in or on the host uh, and and it could these are typically smaller and they, they don't leave evidence. Like I said earlier, um, they're they're not really visible. They're another one that's kind of hard to tell if you have a, a parasite that's in your garden. Uh, but they can be beneficial. Um, they help control other nuisance pests that could be, you know, eating on your on your vegetable plants. And then pathogens. These are uh, these are biological agents like bacteria, uh, viruses, fungi, uh, those type of things. They kill, reduce reproduction, slow growth, or even shorten the life of a pest. Uh, it may take several days to take control. Uh, usually they're very specific and these do leave evidence. So if you have like a pathogen uh, in your garden, you'll, you will find the evidence of this. Uh, and usually you can research and find out, you know, uh, whatever evidence it leaves behind to find out, you know, what exactly is going on in your garden. And then, you know, my favorite topic is pollinators. Um, these are birds, bees, butterflies, moths, flies, beetles, bats, uh, some other mammals. Um, these are essential to our food production. Uh, there are about 100 crops, uh, species that they, sorry, uh, they provide for about 100 crops, uh, provide for the, 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 the pollinating for those crops. Uh, and over 70% of those crops are pollinated by bees. All right, so how do we conserve these, these good guys? Uh, we want to plant resource plants that feed and shelter these natural enemies. Uh, we want to modify our pesticide use, reduce the amount or frequency of application, uh, apply when beneficials are not active, uh, and then use selective products. And then some of the benefits of planting pollinators, it increases uh, yield and the product quality. It provides a windbreak. It builds soil, adds to the health of the landscape. Uh, is, it's attractive to look at, increases uh, the habitat for pollinators and uh, it helps with pest control. And then some other sustainable gardening practices I'm gonna talk about is cover crops, uh, pollinator strips, hedge groves, and buffer strips. Um, cover crops, why should you use cover crops? Uh, it helps with weed suppression, reduces soil erosion from runoff, uh, improves the so soil uh, quality, uh, reduces uh, the surface crusting from the sun uh, during the hot months, it adds organic material back to the soil. Um, it's fixing hydrogen, uh, salvaging uh, soil nitrogen. It's uh, pest suppression. And um, pollinator strips and plots, these can be used around the perimeter of your garden. Uh, you can plant these in rolls within your garden. Uh, you can plant them near your garden. Uh, they're a great companion planting tool. Uh, you can plant these to attract uh, pollinators and other uh, beneficial insects like that to help pollinate your plants. And then uh, hedgerows are another uh, good attractive plant for pollinators. Um, and they're also a good way to produce food. Uh, a lot of the berry bushes, uh, elderberry, raspberry, blackberries, those type, any type of fruit trees, uh, those make really good. And it, it helps uh, the wind from knocking down those more delicate plants that are, might be in your garden or before they are well established and they're trying to get grown and strong. Um, it helps protect them from the wind. And then uh, buffer strips, these are really important, especially for like larger farming uh, operations. You wanna protect the water source that's near you. Um, Cause a lot of these bigger farms, they use pesticides and that runoff ends up getting into the water. It impairs the riparian area. It's, it causes a number of problems for water quality. Um, so it's really important if you are farming uh, and you're by, you're near a water source, make sure that you leave a little bit of the vegetation. 
Um, that way it's got something to kind of filter that runoff before it makes it to the water, before that goes to the creek, to the, to the river and, you know, out to the ocean. Um, and it also, uh, it provides a shelter for many animals as well and a, a, a source of food. And uh, on this page here, here are some OMRI approved insecticides. Uh, these are some things that you can use in your garden uh, that are gentle, that are better than using some of the typical stuff that you see uh, in your, in your uh, hardware stores or typical gardening stores. Uh, I definitely recommend neem oil, uh, some horticultural oil. I've used some of these products, some of these I haven't. Um, I plan to try some new stuff this year because uh, I try to avoid using any type of pesticides on my on my garden. So here are some some different options uh, if you guys are curious. And uh, there is my contact information. I want to thank you guys for joining in today. And if you have any questions or you'd like to partner with us in some of our community garden efforts that we do with the reintegration center, please reach out to me. My office and cell phone number are provided and my email address is there. So if anybody is interested in joining us, give me a call. We would love the help. Thanks, Christy. So um, if you guys are willing to take a few questions, if anyone has any questions, we can go ahead and do that. We have a little bit of time if the presenters are okay with that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So if anyone has any questions, um, you have the ability to unmute yourself. So if you have any questions, please feel free to do so now. Okay, well, I haven't gotten any questions and I haven't seen anything in the chat box. So if anyone thinks of any questions in the meantime, please feel free to reach out to me or our presenters. Um, I, a huge thank you to Muskogee Creek Nation. Thank you guys so much for joining us today and giving such wonderful presentations. Um, thank you, Dean, Trenton, and Christy for presenting, and I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.